Hey guys, it's Jamie bringing you another episode of Recovery Inspired Hope. And here today, I'm really excited to bring you Robin Elliott, co-founder of Georgia Overdose Prevention. She's going to talk to us a little bit about being a woman in long-term recovery and how she came out with the passion to come um, to have this nonprofit and all the service work she does. So Robin, go ahead and tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Hi, Jamie. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Robin Elliott. As Jamie said, I'm the co-founder of Georgia Overdose Prevention, and I am a person, a woman in long-term recovery. What that means to me is that it's been over 29 years since I've had my last mind-altering or mood-altering substance. Awesome. Awesome. And you, um, we were talking earlier about your pathway and you did, um, you did meetings for uh, like a little bit, but you were a mom and you were trying to juggle being a mom and being in recovery, which is super challenging. Yeah. So for me, um, what really happened for me was I was married, happily married. My husband and I used to like to party, but I was very high functioning. I, mean, I had a really good job. I was working hard had my son. And when Zach was about one, you know, I had grown up, honestly, I grew up like with Gina Ward Cleaver. You're probably too young to know who that is. But anyway, just like in this really wholesome, like wonderful family. And I was uh, drinking a lot at night when I got home from work. And when Zach was about one, I just thought, I just realized that was not what I wanted for my child. I just knew that that, I just knew because of my own background that that was just not what I wanted for him. So I decided to quit drinking, which was like a crazy thing because I decided to quit drinking like, you know, a million times before that and never did. But once I made it for one day, I thought, oh, maybe I could make one more day. And, you know, it was really literally like that. So anyway, um, I, I, I wanted to go to meetings. I wanted to go sort of that traditional path, but I was working full time. I just wanted to be with Zach. And I thought, you know, I drop him at daycare. What am I going to pick him up at six and then go to a meeting and then never see him. I mean, I just couldn't do that. So I just kind of did it my own way, I guess is, is the best I can say. But, you know, it, it, 29 years later, here I am. So I guess for me, it worked. And, um, you know, what I know for sure, it, you know, it was an abstinence model. I mean, I quit and I never had another drink ever. And, um, but I do really believe in and recognize because of my own journey that there are multiple pathways to recovery and that you can, um, you know, be successful. Absolutely. I always say whatever is working for you, keep doing more of it. And sometimes you go through things. I know I've gone through, I started with, you know, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, and then I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. Then I went to celebrate recovery and then I kind of went into like fitness working for me. And then I found my, I call my true love language in recovery and that is service. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I, I actually know a lot of people that, you know, yoga has worked for them. And, you know, so I, I, I just like, I always say whatever gets you there, you know, whatever gets you there. If you can get there, that's great. Yes. And so tell us behind the passion behind coming up with Georgia Overdose Prevention. Yeah, so my son, Zach, and I brought a picture to show you because I love him. Here he is, my beautiful, beautiful, sweet, talented son, Zach. Um, you know, he grew up, my husband, Zach's father, died when Zach was four. So um, it was just the two of us, but he knew pretty much his whole life that that I didn't drink. And then gradually as time went on, you know, he asked me why I, and I explained it, he knew. And he was really against drugs and everything. And um, in his sophomore year in high school, he went to a party, called me from the party, said, mom, the kids are going to get some weed. I just want to get out of there. That was in October. He was 16 in November. He went to another party. The kids were smoking weed. He tried it. And by the following February, he had tried everything. I mean, literally everything that there is to try. And so I figured it out pretty quickly, sent him off to Utah. He spent a year out there, his whole junior year in high school in Utah, came back. Um, and uh, let's see, 12th grade was kind of bad. Um, freshman year college. And as I was telling you earlier, Jamie, he was, he was really smart. I mean, and I know all moms say that, but he scored over 700 on all the sections of his SATs. I mean, he was just like, he just really had a beautiful, brilliant mind. 
but he failed almost everything his freshman year in college because he was just getting high all the time. And um, at the end of that year, he came to me and just said, I'm done. I don't want this anymore. So he went up to Tennessee and spent a year and a half living in, in um, he went through 30 day through quarter care and then living in like recovery community up there and seemed to be doing okay. And then anyway, he moved back to my in-laws in uh, March of 2011 and um, moved in with them and he had relapsed a little bit shortly before that. So anyway, he was moving, moved in with them and, you know, grandparents rules. He went to AA meeting every day, got a great sponsor, um, church on Sunday, Sunday school after church, no car, get a job. <laughs> Poo. So, and he was doing all that. My father-in-law picked him up on the night of April 30th from work. And he sat and talked to my in-laws from 1130 until 12, from 1030 till 11. And then at 1101, they went to 11 o'clock, they went to bed. 1101, he called his sponsor, talked to his sponsor till 1131. Then he called a girl that he liked. And then he, um, at 1133, he called, uh, the heroin dealer in Atlanta. My in-laws had left the keys on the kitchen counter and um, he didn't have a car, but anyway, he grabbed the keys and took off. My father-in-law called me the next morning and just said, Zach's gone. I started calling him and texting him, calling him, texting him, no answer. And at three o'clock that afternoon, um, I got the call from my father-in-law that they had found um, Zach's body in the backseat of his grandparents' car in the English Avenue neighborhood of Atlanta that they call the bluff. And um, this he had died of a heroin overdose. He was 21. So uh, kind of, you know, I always say, Jamie, it's like dominoes falling. I mean, I don't know why things happen the way they do. Sometimes it's just like, it really feels like there's something bigger at work than, um, but the day after we buried Zach on May, May 7th and on May 8th, there was an article in the paper about these three kids that had died of heroin overdoses in Milton. And you know, in 2011, nobody was talking about this. It wasn't on the front page of the papers. It wasn't in on the news every night. I mean, when I was a, as a mother of a child that was doing, it was very lonely because you weren't telling anybody. You didn't want to tell anybody. You were so there was so much shame and guilt and stigma and everything around it. So when I saw that article, I was like, oh my gosh! And I wrote an, a letter to the, um, I wrote an email to the reporter. And that was kind of it. But then she called me a few months later and said, would you like to go down to the bluff with me? I'm going to the Atlanta Harm Reduction Coalition. And I had never heard of harm reduction, didn't have any idea what it was, but I went down there I learned about it. The article came out, that was it. And then about eight months later, the woman that run, the woman, Mona Bennett, that runs the Atlanta Harm Reduction Coalition called me and said, would you be interested in trying to get a law passed? This married couple had just lost their friend, Nick. And they're trying to get a law passed in Georgia. And of course, I didn't know anything about that. I'm an idiot. I mean, I've never been in the Capitol. I didn't know anything about that, but I said I would do it. So we got started and it was the four of us and then Lori and Susan joined us. And then we started hearing about other people that were like-minded, that were interested and the, our group just kept getting bigger and bigger. And one of Zach's best friends was the first year law student working at the Capitol. And he um, agreed to, to help us because we didn't know what to do. And he uh, got us an invitation to Sharon Cooper's house, who's the sponsor. She sponsor wound up sponsoring our bill. So we took it through the 2014 session. And I mean, we worked so hard. I mean, I can't even tell you, but um, we were honored to stand with Governor Deal on uh, April 24th, 2014, when he signed the Georgia 911 Medical Amnesty and expanded naloxone access bill into law. So, um, that was kind of the beginning of it. And then, you know, we, we thought we were done. Like the law got passed, yay. And then five days later, um, we got a call that somebody had died. This kid had died and his friends were with him and they didn't call 911. And we realized that we weren't done, that we had to tell people about the law. So let me take a second right now, because this really is what we do, is tell you what the law says. The law says two things. Number one, don't run, call 911. If you're in the presence of someone that overdoses, you call 911 and stay with the victim until help arrives. Neither the caller nor the victim can be arrested, charged, or prosecuted in the state of Georgia for personal use quantities of drugs or paraphernalia, um, can't be violated on parole, probation, or if they have conditions to pretrial release. Prior to our law being passed, naloxone was available in an emergency room, maybe on an OR floor. I mean, always on an OR floor where they had um, 
uh, opiate-based anesthesia, and if you were lucky on an ambulance. Um, but what our law says is that now any doctor can prescribe it, any pharmacist can dispense it, and anyone in the state of Georgia can administer it at the scene of a suspected overdose, and they uh, don't have to worry about civil, criminal, or professional licensing liability for doing that. Um, and a subsubsequent law to ours passed, it said you don't even need a prescription. So now if you need Narcan, Naloxone, which is the opiate antidote, you just have to walk into a pharmacy and say, I'd like some Narcan and they'll, and they'll get it for you. So really yeah. what we do now is we just travel around and we teach people about the law and distribute Narcan. That's our new job. That's our, we're all volunteers. You know, we're all 100% volunteer organization. We have 80, Lori, who's really the backbone. She's trained 85 distributors around the, the state, and so we have distributors in all 85. I mean, all 100. And, I think it's 149 counties in Georgia, and um, that's what we do. Yes, absolutely. And I keep not. I keep Narcan in my car. I have two in my car at all times. Um, and we were talking earlier. You know, um, so Robin, for all you guys. Um, this is how impactful it is. She saved like more than one of my friends' lives, <laughs> more than one. One specifically, 16 times, a very good friend of mine, 16 times she went and gave, and gave him Narcan, talked with him and helped him until he was ready at, to come to get treatment. And now he's a superstar in recovery. So there is, is hope, you know, um, I always say, uh, dead people can't find recovery. So it's just, I mean, you know, what would, what do you say? We didn't get to talk about this. What do you say to people who are like against harm reduction, who think that, you know, um, it's like an enabling thing or, or just allowing people. Yeah. You know, um, when we first got started, I remember somebody and I won't even tell you who it is because I'm sure you know who they are very active in the recovery community that just told me, she said, don't say harm reduction down at the Capitol. That's a dirty word. And, you know, as they say, a ship turns slowly, like you don't reverse course for the ship. It's just too big. It, it turns slowly. But now, I mean, there's a harm reduction group um, at, that runs through the Department of Public Health. There's a harm reduction group that runs through DP, DBHDD. I mean, harm reduction is no longer a dirty word. We do still get that objection. We've heard people say, well, everybody, if they get Narcan, then they should have to go to treatment as soon as they get Narcan. And, you know, to me, that's just people that don't really understand what recovery is about because that doesn't work. I mean, that's not doing anything. Um, what I usually say is what you said. My line is always, you know, dead people don't recover. So, and I, I frequently tell them, if, if, if it's somebody that I think will appreciate this, I say, you know, Greg Allman from the Allman Brothers, he went to treatment 11 times, but he never had to go back the 12th. He finally got it. And, you know, it finally was at that place that for him, it was the right time. In the last 15 years of his life, he was in recovery. So, I mean, people get there at different times, but if they don't, if we don't keep them alive, if we don't keep them breathing, they may never get there. So true. I mean, I went through detox eight different times. Yeah, <laughs> it took me. But yeah, it didn't. It didn't take yeah. the first time for sure. For sure. Yeah. And um, and you know, we were talking earlier too about. I just went to a wedding. You know, not even two weeks ago, where the the wife administered Narcan to the husband a year ago and saved his life and. I got to go to their wedding and now they're happy doing great. So um, it's, it's just so amazing. It's so, it's so amazing. You're so courageous for the way that you just, you know, took everything and turned it and are now just such a pillar in the community and in the state and saving lives and made this pathway, you know, for the state of Georgia to be a leader in this. And well, thank you. I mean, it was really a collaborative group. I mean, it was a group of us that did it and, for me, it's a labor of love and it was really, part of it was selfish. I mean, I had to do, I needed something to get me out of bed every day. I needed something to keep me alive. And so I, I frequently say Narcan saved my life too, but just in a different way, because I needed something to just keep me wanting to take a step forward every day because he was my only child. And, you know, it, it's, I mean, ten, it's almost 10 years and it's, 
still incredibly painful. But, um, you know, so I did it for that reason. I did it because I wanted Zach's memory, but I also did it because I felt like I had an opportunity to try to change the law, but also erase a little of the stigma. Have somebody come out and say, this is who, this is who can be addicted to heroin. This is who can be an opiate addict. My beautiful, bright, private school, educated, guitar playing, sports kid. I mean, he was a great kid. And, and so are a million other people that have substance use disorder, but it's not the perception necessarily. So I think it's really important for all of us who are in the community to make sure that we, we speak up and we show who we are, you know, absolutely recover out yeah. loud. Yes. Yeah. I always say that, you know, and for me, especially when I lost my anonymity, my chains of guilt and shame were just broken and I became empowered to help other people and not Agreed. be ashamed anymore. You know, yeah. I'm like, this is what recovery looks like. I'm a tax paying business owner who's about to buy my first house. You know, like Woo-hoo! we're not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're we're not what people think. And we really, it, you know, I, I'm on a mission to stomp out the stigma for sure. For yeah. Sure. So, um, and tell us a little bit about how, how people can get a hold of Narcan or get trainings. Yeah, let me tell you, so far in the state of Georgia, we've distributed tens of thousands of kits, well over, I think it's over 30,000 kits. I, I, I honestly have lost count. Uh, Lori would know, but, um, but I do know this much that Atlanta Harm Reduction, we ask people to call us if they use the kit and they're successful, they successfully reverse someone. And so we know for sure of uh, between Atlanta Harm Reduction that does the 10 block area down in English Avenue and Little Five, they do that area too. And we do the rest of the state. We know between the kids they kits they distribute and the kits we distribute that we have um, saved over um, 3,000 people have let us know that they're, they've had a successful reversal with our kits. And we know that number is really underreported because as we frequently say at the scene of an overdose, most people probably don't think, oh, let's call Robin and Lori. You know, I mean, I think they probably just do what they do. And then anecdotally, eventually we find out or somebody tells us, or, you know, we find out about it, but we think there's lots of people out there that have been saved that we don't even know about. So um, so anyway, yes, anybody can get a kit. Um, we try to, we try to reserve kits are available. First of all, at the pharmacy, if you have insurance, if you, if you know, they, you don't need a prescription, you can just walk in there and get them it, for people at high risk. And certainly people that don't have insurance, families of people at high risk, um, they can write to us at info at Georgia spelled out overdose prevention.org, or they can go onto our website at www.georgiaoverdoseprevention.org. And on the website, there's a form, you can just fill it out. They will immediately send an email to Lori and to me. We respond within 24 hours to all requests. We used to do all of our trainings. We have 85 distributors, as I said, said throughout Georgia. We used to do all of our kit distribution in person, but now we do because of COVID, um, we're mailing kits. So, you know, we just want people to stay alive. So whatever we need to do to get a kit in the hands of someone that needs it, we'll do it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I'll make sure that I post that on the video when we share it to all of our people out here. And we're so grateful for you. Thank you so much, Robin. And um, make sure that you guys subscribe to Jamie Tall on YouTube and share this video because everybody needs to know about this, that harm reduction works, how, how to apply it in their life and, um, and, and recover out loud. Make sure you um, keep checking, checking the Jamie Tall Facebook page for new info and, and things like that. So we'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin, so much. Thank you, Jamie. Bye. Bye.